In Revelation 14, the Bible tells us about the 144,000 virgin male Jews who are redeemed from the earth in a rapture. And they are with the Lord in heaven on the heavenly Mount Zion. And in this chapter, we also see what heaven is like compared to what the world is like during the coming time of Jacob's trouble. And we also see the condition of the saints of God compared to the people who are still on the earth. So, this is going to be heaven versus the world. Uh, number one, we have the Father's name versus the name of the beast. Revelation 14, 1 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his Father's name written in their foreheads. These 144,000 are standing on the heavenly Mount Zion with the Lamb. Notice the capital L on the word Lamb. It is obviously the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. They have the Father's name written in their forehead. So their, face, their faith is written all over their face. I'd say their face probably shines like Moses and Jesus when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Being right with God can change your countenance. But these 144,000 Jews are safe and secure in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they have the Father's name, which Exodus 6.3 says is Jehovah. And it's written in their foreheads. This is the opposite of the world who will have the mark or the name of the beast in their right hand and in their foreheads. Now the mark and the name could be something completely different. I'm not so sure all that will work and be set up but one group of people is going to be in allegiance to God and the other is going to be in allegiance to Satan Revelation 14:9 talks about those with the mark of the beast 14:9 through 11 says and the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So these people in the world, on the earth, chose the name of the beast, over the name of God. They chose the pleasures of sin for a season rather than the blessing of God for all eternity. People do the same thing today when they die in their sin. When they reject Jesus Christ and die without God, they chose the world and the devil over the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these people will drink the wine of the wrath of God. So these people will have the mark in their forehead. Kind of like Harry Potter has the satanic ass lightning bolt on his forehead. And they will have to go to hell for eternity and then the lake of fire. The 144,000 have the Father's name and they are going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Revelation 22 4 says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Not just the 144,000, but other tribulation saints will also live and reign with Christ, they also reject the mark. Revelation 20 and verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So it seems like in the time of Jacob's trouble, it is going to be written across your face who you are serving. Your spiritual state is going to be seen on your face. Revelation 17, 5 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. If God wants to give us a mark, then he will give it to us. I don't think we should mark up our own bodies. Even if it is getting a tattoo of Jesus or a Bible verse, our mark of being a Christian should be letting people see us read the Bible, be separate, live holy, and witness to others. But 
So in this coming time period, there's going to be some with the Father's name, and there's going to be some with the name of the beast. The heavenly people is going to get the Father's name. The worldly people who love this present evil world are going to choose the name of the beast. But next we see the voice of God versus the voice of blasphemy. Revelation 14.2 says, And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Jesus said, My sheep know my voice. God has a voice that sounds like thunder. It sounds like many waters. This is the same voice that Adam and Eve heard walking in the garden. This is the same voice that spoke to Moses out of a burning bush. Something I don't understand is why God is mindful of man enough to come and talk to individual men. When God talked to Moses, no one else was around. I believe God talks to all of us individually and has all of us a mission that he wants us to do. But in Revelation 14, God has the voice of many waters. And if you look in Psalms 29.3, it says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Ezekiel 43.2, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Revelation one fifteen, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So his voice sounds like many waters. The sound of water can help you go to sleep. The sound of rain or waterfalls can help a person go to sleep at night. And this is different from the voice of blasphemy. The voice of blasphemy is what keeps people awake. It keeps people in fear and distress, and the Antichrist will have this voice. Revelation thirteen five and 6 says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So this is the same voice that talked to Jesus Christ and tempted him. The Antichrist is Satan's mouthpiece. So this is the same voice that talked to Eve in the garden. Eve heard in person the voice of God and the voice of the devil. We can't audibly hear these voices, but both of these voices have been in our mind as well. In the time of Jacob's trouble, the voice of blasphemy is going to be all over the television all over the news, all over social media, in your living room, and if the technology is there, it may play in your head with the click of a button. They have all these things like amber alerts and things that go off on your phone to alert you of a kidnapping and things like that. If the technology is there and they put something in your brain, they may be sending you alerts of what you have to do next to worship the beast. You aren't going to have freedom of worship. You are going to have to worship the Antichrist to stay alive. And if you miss the rapture and go into this horrible time period, you're going to hear the voice of blasphemy. This is the voice that will stand in the temple and say, I am Christ, which will be a lie. The people in the time of Jacob's trouble will have a will hear a voice of blasphemy. Revelation 16.11 it says, And blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repenting out of their deeds. This is the wicked people that took the mark and they're now blaspheming God because he is bringing his plagues and judgment on them. God plagues them and gives them grievous sores all over their body and they will hate God and blaspheme his name. I don't like to hear people say the Lord's name in vain and take his name in vain by saying, the words GD. Uh, I don't like to hear men like Bill Maher cuss God. That is an evil spirit that makes men use their voice to mock and make fun of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is how I know shows like Family Guy and American Dadder of the Devil. They are haters of God and they mock Jesus Christ. There is a big difference between being in the presence of the voice of God in heaven and the voice of blasphemy on earth. One gives you hope and the other leaves you without hope. 
So Revelation 14, 2, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And once again we see instruments in heaven. So the church of Christ crowd, who are against instruments in their worship, are the ones who may get up to heaven and not like it if they're saved because there's going to be instruments in heaven. And evil spirits don't like heaven because the harp makes the unclean spirit depart. In First Samuel sixteen sixteen, David plays on a harp and the unclean spirits depart from Saul. And number three, on in heaven we'll have the songs of praise versus on earth the song of fools. Songs of praise versus the song of fools. Revelation 14.3 says, And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. In heaven they are going to be singing songs of praise, just like the ones in your hymn book. Only they will have some new songs. They will have original stuff. The book of Ecclesiastes says there is no new thing under the sun, but that is under the sun. Heaven isn't it isn't under the sun, and there are going to be some new things in heaven. We will have new names, new songs, new clothes, and on earth it is the same thing repackaged over and over. The Hollywood crowd and music industry play the same thing over and over again, and their songs are killing people spiritually. It is nothing but the song of fools. Ecclesiastes 7, 5 says, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. I believe the wicked music will be a big part of getting worship in this time period, even more than it is now. Revelation fourteen three, And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the, from the earth. And this could be a rapture of the hundred and forty four thousand that will happen sometime during the time of Jacob's trouble, which has nothing to do with our rapture, the pre-trib rapture. But this can remind us we are leaving this wicked world soon in a rapture of our own, the pre-tribulation rapture, and we will also be in heaven with Jesus Christ. So, there's going to be wicked music in the time of Jacob's trouble, but up in heaven, they're going to be singing a new song. And number four, we have clean versus dirty. Heaven is completely clean from any sin and filthiness, while the world lieth in wickedness. And we can see by looking at the world today that it is obsessed with filthy perversion. You can't go anywhere without seeing women dressed up like whores. Pornographic images are everywhere. And everything is set up to tempt men and women into sin. Sin is rampant. And this is a dirty place that is against God and against His commandments. How much more so in the time of Jacob's trouble where iniquity is going to abound? Revelation fourteen four and 5 says, And these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. How great will it be when we get to heaven around people who have our best interest at heart, who we could trust with all of our heart without fear of being betrayed. No guile is found in their mouth, and this means there will be no trickery or deception coming out of their mouth the bible says there was no guile found in jesus mouth and this goes opposite to the world where men will be deceiving and being deceived they'll be tricking everybody with their words these hundred and forty four thousand are also not defiled with women all these hundred and forty four thousand are made up of the male jews from the tribes of israel and many say it would be hard to find 144,000 Jewish male virgins. I just believe what it says. Possibly the women are so perverted and wicked in this time period that these male virgins kept themselves from women. I mean, even today you have Christian men who just can't find a Christian wife to marry, so they're not marrying anybody. And maybe that is why Proverbs gives us such a warning on the strange woman. 
the people in the time of Jacob's trouble will be reading those verses back there and realize her steps really do take hold on hell. And since these are male virgins, the Jehovah's Witnesses would have to admit that they aren't a part of the 144,000. I mean, if you're not a virgin and you're not a male, that knocks out all the females who aren't virgins and all the men who aren't virgins, and you're automatically disqualified. Also, if you're not a Jew, you're disqualified. So that knocks out more. But Revelation 14.4 4 says, These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Are you following the Lamb where he goes? The best way to not defile yourself with women and keep your mouth from speaking guile is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and follow his pastors and teachers that are following Jesus Christ. If you keep yourself in constant prayer, in Bible reading, and into the things of God, you will be less likely to slip up in sin. And now we are going to take an even deeper look at what is going on in the earth at this time. And we see judgment versus safety. On earth, there will be judgment, but the saints in heaven are safe. They are safe from death, safe from being martyred, persecution, from cussing and sin, and from the wrath and judgment of God. The people on the earth will not be safe from these things. Revelation 14, 6 says, And I saw another mighty angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So it seems this angel can be seen and heard by people on the earth. There won't be a lack of signs in this time period. There will be no excuse for man to be an atheist. And this angel will be flying because according to Daniel 9.21, angels can fly swiftly. Yet Hebrews 13.2 says you can entertain angels unaware. So this angel will probably be a wingless creature who looks like a man. As they do throughout the Bible. And there will prob probably be pictures and videos of this angel all over social media. Imagine being in this time period and everyone will pull out their iPhone 12 or 13 or 14 or iPhone 20 and take portraits of this angel and post it on Instagram and Facebook. And this angel will be a UFO, an unidentified flying object. And people may say it is a hologram or Project Blue Beam because they're going to be under strong delusion. And I believe there is going to be a lot of saints in the tribulation who aren't deceived by the Antichrist, and they'll know this angel is the real deal. There will also be many people who aren't deceived by the world rulers and their wickedness, but are still deceived in other ways. They may put this angel in their list of conspiracies and spend hours trying to prove that this wasn't really an angel but a hologram of some sort. In Revelation 14.7, says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God. This is what the angel is saying. Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. God will be raining down His wrath and judgment. But yet the people in heaven will be in safety and rejoicing. The lesson we can learn from this is that although we may have friends in turmoil and seeing others in distress... We should still joy in the Lord and not let the bad news bring us down. Who is the one they are commanded to worship? Not the Antichrist. He didn't make heaven, earth, and the sea. Jesus Christ did, as Colossians chapter 1 says in verse 16, For by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. John 1, 3, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. If you build a house and you were letting other people live in it, would you not be mad if they broke the rules you laid out for your house? God made the world. He's letting you live in it. He wants you to, to abide by his rules. But this angel is preaching the everlasting gospel and the message isn't about the death, burial, and resurrection. So it isn't the gospel we preach in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. The message is in the following verse. It's fear God and give glory to Him. As Revelation 14, 7 says. Uh, Revelation 14, 6 says this message is, is to every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. A gospel is the good news. 
And moving on, we have gold streets in heaven versus streets of destruction on earth. Revelation 14, 8 says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This shows the book of Revelation isn't actually in chronological order. You have Babylon falling again in Revelation 17 and 18. But no doubt the world is going to be destroyed piece by piece. Look up pictures of the end of days and you might get an idea of what the streets will look like during this time period. Fiery cars, toppled over buildings, trash in the streets, broken down bridges. The sinful place Babylon will be destroyed because of her sin and because she caused others to sin. And the pleasures of sin only last for a season. They had a good run, but payday is coming. Notice the verse says, She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is speaking of spiritual fornication, people whoring after false gods. And what happens when you commit fornication? You're naked. So Jesus Christ will catch them with their pants down. He will expose their shame. Nahum 3 and verse 5 says, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness, and the kingdoms thy shame. He will make them drink the wine of his wrath. And when they drink the wine of his wrath, they are exposed. They wanted Jesus Christ to be a wine bibber and someone who pressures people into drinking. So he gives them something to drink, the wine of his wrath. And notice the same thing happening to those who take the mark and worship the beast. Revelation fourteen nine through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. When Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent, he comes with fire. The Bible says in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this fire forms a lake of fire on earth in Edom. And you can read about that in Isaiah 34. And these people will burn for eternity. They will be called up to the great white throne after the millennium and be tossed into the lake of fire again. Verse 11 says, The smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And this is where rock concerts get the idea for smoke all over the stage and fire and darkness. It just all resembles hell. The verse said, They have no rest, day nor night, and you will be eternally exhausted. You will never sleep or lay down. You will wallow around in misery. They have no hope once they receive the mark in their forehead or in their hand, which could be a tattoo because the ink actually goes in the skin, but it also could be a microchip because it goes in the hand. And with all the technology we have, this doesn't seem far-fetched anymore. There are already stores where you can go in, pick up a product, and you don't even have to check out. Some type of technology what you wear just takes the money out of your account. But these people in the in this time period are going to drink from the cup of God's wrath. God has a cup. The more a nation or a people sin, the fuller it will get. And the Bible says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full in the book of Genesis. But when that cup gets full... God turns it over. Jesus talked about the cup passing from him, talking about the cup of God's wrath on sin. Revelation fourteen twelve says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This verse proves there are people who have, to, who have and do keep the commandments. There have been people that have kept the commandments, but this doesn't mean that they are sinless. And there are going to be people who keep the commandments in the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. But this doesn't mean that they haven't sinned or that they don't sin. Uh, James 2 and verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law 
and yet offended in one point, he is guilty of all. So there is someone who kept the whole law. But, I mean, he offended it eventually. Galatians three ten and 11 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. No man is justified by the law, but that doesn't mean no one ever kept it. Someone could have done everything required in the Old Testament law, yet they weren't justified in the sense of a New Testament Christian, because Jesus Christ hadn't died on the cross in the Old Testament. It hadn't happened yet. And other verses show that some people kept the law or kept the commandments. Exodus 20 and verse 6 says, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Deuteronomy 7 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Luke 1 6 says, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So there's people who, they were just keep constantly keeping the commandments. And then when a person broke a commandment, they would offer the prescribed sacrifice. And then they would become again blameless when it comes to the law. Because God did forgive people, even in the Old Testament. But the the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. That wasn't the blood of Jesus Christ. It couldn't take away their sin. They didn't get to heaven by being good and having good works or by sacrificing an animal. That stuff was temporary stuff. It got them to paradise in the heart of the earth. But the blood of Jesus Christ got them to the third heaven. If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, they would still be in the heart of the earth in paradise. They wouldn't be able to go up. Uh, Proverbs 7, 2 says, Keep my commandments and live, and my law is as the apple of thine eye. If you couldn't keep his commandments, then why would God tell you to keep it? You can keep it. You can keep the commandments. You don't have to uh, sin. You probably will because you're a sinner. But God says, Keep my commandments and live. So, there was people in the Old Testament that kept the commandments. Joshua 22, 1 and 2 says, Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said unto them, Ye have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. So there's some people here that kept all, the, all that Moses commanded. And then once again in Judges 2.17 it says, And yet they would not hearken to their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord. But they did not so. So there's some other people that obeyed the commandments. First Kings 11.34 Howbeit I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life, for David, my servant's sake, whom I chose, because he kept my commandments and my statutes. So David, he kept the commandments. He eventually broke them. He committed adultery and murder. But he had the sure mercies of David, something different than other people in the Old Testament. They didn't have the sure mercies of David. If they committed adultery and murder, they'd be killed. But David... Nathan told David that he's going to live. His sin wasn't, was, wasn't looked at by God so, because he had the sure mercies of David. We're in the same case. We believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. God puts away our sin. He doesn't count it to our record. Second Kings 18.6 says, For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. Second Kings twenty two two and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. Psalms one nineteen fifty five I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night, 
and have kept thy law. So back to Revelation fourteen twelve, and we will see death and martyrdom versus having the victory. Death and martyrdom versus having the victory. On earth these saints will face persecution and death. And after that it is complete victory. Revelation fourteen twelve says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Once again, you have someone that's keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. 14, 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. We see that righteousness in this time also comes from faith in Jesus Christ. But something is added to it. They also keep the commandments. They have to stay away from taking the mark and worshiping an image. If you take the mark, you broke one of the commandments. They are blessed when they die in the Lord from henceforth because they can finally rest from their labor. They had to labor to enter into his rest. Hebrews 14 and 11 says, For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The verse in Revelation 14 also says their works do follow them. Their works will be the basis of their judgment. At the great white throne judgment, Jesus Christ judges men according to their works. And this is completely different than the judgment seat of Christ where we are judged. We are judged on our service. Um, the good things we did with the right motive will get us rewards. We're not judged on sin. Our sins have already been paid for. In heaven, we aren't going to have to worry about doing right and not doing wrong. We will be sinless beings without a thought of foolishness. And next we see, in heaven, we will be in the presence of God's love, while the ones on earth are under His wrath. Matthew twenty four thirty one says, and he shall send his angels with the great son of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And this refers to a post-tribulation rapture of tribulation saints, which is different from the pre-tribulation rapture of born-again believers in the body of Christ. And this is a different rapture than the 144,000 at the beginning of chapter 14. But in Revelation 14, 14 through 16, it talks about this gathering together of the elect, which are tribulation saints. Revelation 14 through 16 says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. Notice that Jesus comes with, always comes with clouds. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. This reaping seems to happen sometime before the second advent. Because as you can see here in Revelation fourteen fourteen, Jesus Christ is only wearing a golden crown. When he comes back on Revelation 19, he has many crowns. The people called up to be with Jesus Christ in this rapture will also come back with Jesus Christ. At this time, the people on the earth will be drinking the wine of his wrath. Revelation fourteen seventeen through 20 says, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and he cried with a loud, full, loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. In verse 18, it talks about the vine of the earth. And these are the people who will be stomped and trampled over by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Micah 4.13 talks about it. It says, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people. And I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Jesus Christ will thresh the heathen. He will be like a threshing machine. Revelation 19.15 says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He will stomp on the people like we would stomp on grapes. And the blood will go up to the horse bridles. He will stomp every God-hater. Psalm 68.23 says that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. Isaiah 63.6 6 says, And I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Revelation 14.20 says the same thing. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. And the you see uh, in Revelation fourteen fourteen through sixteen, you had the people going up in a rapture. The rest of the chapter was about the people that were left and stomped over by Jesus Christ. But it was a different rapture than the pre tribulation rapture. Don't get them confused. Matthew twenty four thirty one says he shall send his angel with a, with a great son of a trumpet, and he shall gather together his elect. From the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other, we're already gone by that time. That is uh, tribulation saints being caught up. When that exactly takes place, I'm not sure. And when the 144,000 are redeemed, I'm not quite sure when that takes place. I just see it as like how we don't know when the rapture happens now. I have no idea when the rapture is going to take place. I'm not looking for a sign for the rapture in the sense of going in the Bible and trying to figure out what day it's going to be. I'm just, every day when I wake up, I'm thinking, maybe the rapture could be today. Maybe it could be this afternoon. I just look at it that way. I don't try to figure out when the rapture will be. So I don't really try to figure out when these raptures will be. I feel like that could be wasting my time a little bit. If somebody wants to do that, then that's fine. But we don't know the exact time of each rapture. But this has been Revelation chapter 14.